right, and now it's time to officially start the program. Welcome to 60 Minutes in Space. Now, throughout the program, uh, if you have any questions or comments, put those into the chat, and we'll have a little bit of time at the end to address those. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Denver Museum of Nature and Science, Curator of Space Sciences, Dr. Kachun Yu. Thank you very much, Mitch. And um, as Mitch um, says, my name is Kachun, and I am an astronomer at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And welcome to 60 Minutes in Space, where we cover um, the latest news from astronomy and planetary science and human space flight. And um, I typically, um, for those of you who um, are relatively new to this, um, I um, will typically cover um, topics outside of our solar system. And my counterpart um, will usually cover things inside the solar system. And as Mitch says, um, today we have a special guest, Dr. Steve Lee, who was uh, our um, curator of planetary science at the museum until he retired last year. So it's um, a great pleasure uh, for us to welcome him back and to hear uh, from him about um, the latest discoveries from Mars and elsewhere and other happenings in our solar system. But uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and um, get started. And um, so I'm gonna uh, switch over to my PowerPoint. And I have two stories that I want to uh, report on. And can um, everyone see the PowerPoint? Okay. So, um, and both of those stories um, were uh, from the last um, several weeks. So they um, are literally um, hot off the presses. And the, uh, the first story um, is about um, planets beyond our, our um, solar system, uh, what we call exoplanets or extrasolar planets. And um, for those of you who have been following um, the um, discoveries of um, planets beyond our sun, you know that we've um, found many thousands of them um, actually more than 4,000 now um, in just over the last 25, 26 years. And um, this um, graphic shows that um, the actual number of um, terrestrial or Earth-sized planets uh, are still relatively small, but um, so, so most of the planets that we found are gas giants like Jupiter, but uh, roughly an equal number are Neptune-sized um, worlds. So these are planets about four times the, um, the size of the Earth, four times the diameter of the Earth. And then we have um, another category of planets known as super-Earths. And these are worlds that are typically between two and four times the diameter of the Earth. And so right now, um, it's, it's still difficult to find um, smaller planets, but we are finding lots of these larger worlds. And the way that astronomers have been finding planets, um, you, you can see on this list all the different techniques, but the vast majority of them are um, using a technique known as transits. And transit is, um, is a word, doesn't mean public transportation, but uh, what it means is something passing in front of something else. In this case, a planet passing in front of a star. And so this, um, this chart shows the number of cumul cumulative, cumulative planet discoveries um, over the last, um, actually longer than 25 years, um, because there were um, some um, single planet discoveries back in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and they um, just don't regist register at all. But as you can see, uh, the large green bars uh, correspond to the transit discoveries. And a transit is basically when uh, the planet um, in its orbit around that distant star orbits um, directly in front of it relative to us. And so when it does that, uh, there's a small dip in the starlight. And these systems are so far away that, uh, that you can't um, really see the planet. It's very difficult and the, um, the brightness of the star is so much uh, more brighter than the planet that you can't um, hope to um, see the light reflected off that planet from the star. But what you can do is you can um, see and measure this very small dip in light, um, typically on the order of 1% or less. And, um, and by the size of that dip, we know how big the star is. Um, you can infer the size of the planet and from orbital dy dynamics, um, you, you can also infer um, lots of other information um, what, about that planet and about that planetary system. And so um, the reason why we've been able to discover so many planets, more than 4,000, is that in 19, uh, or in 2009, 
the Kepler mission uh, was launched. And, um, and you can go and learn more about um, exoplanets um, at this NASA uh, website. But uh, Kepler stared at a patch of, uh, of sky towards the constellation of Cygnus, um, over half a million stars. And over that, that almost 10 year period of time, it found more than 25, um, 2,600 uh, planets. Uh, most of them were um, found in that particular patch of sky. There was another phase of the mission where it looked at different regions uh, of the sky, um, but um, overall found over 2,600 of them. And Kepler uh, effectively died uh, a few years ago, back in 2018, and it was replaced just in time by the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. And so right now, TESS has found 4,000, more than 4,000 candidates uh, for planetary systems, but uh, those have to be confirmed by more detailed ground-based observations. And so, so far, uh, more than 100 uh, confirmed planets have come from the TESS mission. So here is an animation from the American Museum of Natural History using the open space software, showing the locations of all known um, actual planets. And so the ones with the purple circles are ones that have been discovered by other techniques. Uh, the yellow um, dots are the ones discovered by Kepler. And so you can see the vast majority of them are in that one direction, but there are other um, directions that have been explored by Kepler. Um, and then um, there's that um, bubble of planets um, closer in that's, um, that are uh, candidates um, found by um, TESS. And then you can see that um, compared to our galaxy, this um, animation shows a visualization of our Milky Way, the number of planets that we've discovered sample just a tiny fraction of the volume of our Milky Way galaxy. So um, we know that, um, uh, I mean, just based on these um, statistics of the planets that we found, we think that planets probably outnumber stars in our Milky Way alone. So <clears throat> the paper um, that I want to talk about um, came out last week and it's by Lisa um, Kaltenager um, from Caltech and Jackie Fahergy at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And basically the idea behind this paper is, um, you know, if we are looking out um, to other stars and discovering planets, exoplanets, uh, could alien astronomers do the same? And could those alien astronomers see and detect the Earth? And so uh, the paper is basically about Earth is seen by these alien um, astronomers, or as the paper um, title um, says, past, present, and future stars that can see Earth as a transiting exoplanet. And the basic idea is that the Earth you know, orbits the sun. And so if you um, have um, stars um, with planets around them that are outside of our solar system, the, the ones that are lined up with the orbital track of the Earth would uh, basically uh, be able to see the Earth tra transit the sun. And so um, <clears throat> we can um, see that in this um, animation. And the data set that they're using um, are stars from the Gaia satellite. And I'll talk in just a minute what um, Gaia is. But uh, you saw all the Gaia stars. But now um, we've turned on um, just the, um, the stars that are um, in line with the, um, with the Earth's orbit around the sun. Um, that path is known as the ecliptic. And so that's this line um, right here. And I'm um, sort of circling. And, um, and the other stars are also Gaia stars. But, um, those are the ones that are in line, <clears throat> but they are uh, visible uh, to us from, our, uh, from here on Earth. And Gaia is basically a satellite built by the European Space Agency. And what it did was it made extremely accurate measurements of stars. And those measurements allow us to determine um, the distances to the stars and also even determine how they're moving in the sky, meaning how um, they move as they orbit around the, the galaxy. So you, um, you know, when we look out at um, the stars up in the sky, they appear yeah, pretty static, um, but uh, they are moving a very small amounts. And, uh, and with a satellite like Gaia, um, we can ac accurately detect those motions. And so this is a map of our galaxy, the, of the entire sky, as mapped by um, Gaia. And, um, and those dark regions uh, are regions um, where um, Gaia didn't see any stars. And so those are regions where you have molecular clouds, gas clouds that occlude or block the starlight. And so um, the Gaia map actually does a pretty good job of showing um, where um, 
stars are in our, in our galaxy, at least as seen from the Earth. And Gaia has basically mapped about 2 billion or over 2 billion stars. And the way that it determines distances is using a technique called parallax. And the basic idea behind that is that um, as um, Gaia and the Earth orbit around the sun, um, and you can see that orbit in blue along the bottom of the, uh, of the diagram there, um, and you can imagine Gaia looking at that yellow star. Well, that yellow star will appear to shift um, against the background stars um, that are further away. And this is the same uh, phenomena that you see if you were driving and uh, you notice that um, objects that are um, close by to you um, on the sidewalk, uh, for instance, um, uh, might um, shift uh, faster or more compared to objects that are further away, like buildings um, or mountains off in the background. And, um, and here is another animation showing how this would actually work. And so this is um, exaggerated, but you can see that as Gaia observes um, stars um, in a particular direction in the sky, um, as it orbits the sun, it's gonna observe these stars making tiny loops. And the closer the star to us, the bigger the loop. And so the further away stars um, will have um, smaller loops that Gaia observes. Now, as I said, um, stars in our galaxy are also in motion uh, as they orbit around uh, the center of our galaxy. So if you include the motion of the stars, instead of closed um, circular loops, the stars all make these, um, these big, bigger wiggles. And um, so this is a combination of the, um, the orbit of the satellite Gaia around the sun, um, creating those loops and the stellar motions, stretching those loops out. And here is um, a map of all the stars that um, Gaia detected. And again, you can see um, the, the shape of our Milky Way. And, um, and here, what the animators have done is that they've ex exaggerated the parallax effects by 100,000 times. And so those um, normally you, um, wouldn't be able to see such big loops, but they've been exaggerated by quite an amount. And then the, um, the proper motion or, or the motion of the stars through the galaxy have also been exaggerated, uh, this time by over a trillion times. And uh, so this gives you a sense of um, how Ga Gaia detects um, stars, but by measuring the size of those loops, um, it can also um, give you a sense of how far away they are. And so here um, are the stars moving um, a trillion times faster than normal. Um, due to their motions around the galaxy. So um, it's uh, um, pretty uh, neat to think about um, how much we can learn um, just from observing uh, the locations or positions of stars extremely accurately. So let's um, get to the, uh, the paper by Kaltenegger and Finnerty. And so, um, as I said, um, you know, what um, they did was to use Gaia to determine the locations of these stars, uh, but they also use Gaia to determine how these stars uh, moved over time. And so what they showed um, was that uh, they could actually um, show uh, motions of the stars, they would run the movie backwards. So basically going back 5,000 years into the past and also going about 5,000 years into the future. And they looked at stars within about 300 light years of, of the sun. And they found about 2,000 of them that were actually in line with the orbit of the Earth. And so if these stars are um, in line with the orbit of the Earth, then an alien astronomer who lived on a planet orbiting those stars could conceivably observe our sun and detect the Earth in transit. And then the, um, we'll go back to, um, to see that animation again. Um, <clears throat> But because these stars are also moving uh, throughout the galaxy, it means that some stars that weren't uh, in, the, um, in line with the, uh, the orbit of the Earth uh, might eventually move into position. And so what they find is that um, currently, or at least over the last 5,000 years, there are about 1,700 stars that are positioned in, um, so that alien astronomers could detect um, our planet Earth in transit around the sun. And in the next 5,000 years, an additional um, 300 stars um, will uh, shift their position so that even though they're not in line now, they will be in the future. And so if you look at the paper online, 
they actually uh, show part of a table and you can download the full table um, of more than 2000 stars. And the table has, um, is listed in order of how um, distant the stars are from us. Um, but um, all, all of these stars uh, either in the past or in the present or in the future, or perhaps all three um, will be in line um, to, for, uh, for them, uh, for an alien astronomer to, uh, to detect uh, the Earth uh, via transit around the sun. And so if you look at the, uh, this table, the very first line is for Wolf um, 359, which is uh, less than eight light years away. And um, it um, was um, able to observe the Earth um, just 46 years ago, so relatively recently. But um, it um, will be able to observe for um, an alien astronomer on a planet around that star, will be able to observe the Earth for another 400 years. So no more than about 480 years. But we don't actually know if Wolf 359 has any planets. So um, the first um, star that we do know of that actually has a planet, one known planet is, is Ross 128. And you can see that Earth was observable from Ross 128 3,000 years ago. But it stopped becoming observable um, just 900 years ago. So you might wonder, you know, if there was an alien astronomer on that star, would they have been able to detect life on Earth? Or would they have been able to detect um, activity of, um, of intelligent life um, given the levels of technology that we had 900 years ago? Now, all in all, um, this table has um, seven stars out of um, more than 2,000 where we've detected uh, planets. And uh, they include TRAPPIST-1 um, uh, towards the bottom there, um, which has seven known stars. And so currently TRAPPIST-1 um, um, can't, um, if there was an alien um, species there, it currently cannot detect the Earth via uh, the, the um, transit method, but it will in about 1,600 years, 1,642 years. And uh, the period that um, it can detect the Earth is just over uh, 2,300 years. So about 4,000 years in the future, TRAPPIST-1 will have shifted its position in the galaxy, so it will no longer be able to see the Earth via transits. And typically, if you look at this table, um, a star that um, is in the Earth's transit zone um, will be in that zone for about a thousand years. So, um, so those alien species, um, you know, they have about a, typically on the order of about a thousand years to look for and potentially find the Earth. Now, another question that you might ask is, um, have any of our um, radio communications leaked out to any of these uh, potential stars? And it turns out um, that uh, they have. Um, you know, radio waves have been leaking out from the Earth for um, the past hundred years. And it turns out that um, in that region of space, in that volume of space, um, about 75 of the stars um, will um, have those radio signals traveling at the speed of light um, wash over them. And um, so uh, that um, <clears throat> does you know, give you a pause if you think about it. You know, this is not just a theoretical question, but um, it almost becomes a practical one in the sense that if there are alien astronomers out there, there are definitely ones um, if they um, live um, within 100 light years of us, um, there is a possibility that they would have known about our species existence um, in um, that time that we've been radiating um, our radio um, communications. All right, so with that, I'm gonna jump to my second and final story. And uh, this is the uh, story about the star that blinked, BBB WIT08. And, uh, and the story has, and again, this is another story that uh, just came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, but um, some of the observations go back much longer. And, uh, and this is um, a story about a star um, that's behaving very strangely <coughs> that astronomers don't quite understand yet. And uh, you might remember, remember that there have been multiple stories um, in recent years about um, situations like this. Um, the star Betelgeuse, for instance, had um, a um, serious dimming um, problem um, over the last um, several years. Um, and um, astronomers thought that it might be on the verge of going supernova. Um, but now we think that it has to do with dust uh, being produced by Betelgeuse's atmosphere that's blocking the starlight. 
And then uh, more re uh, in recent years, back in 2017, uh, you might have heard from me um, in the 60 Minutes in Space uh, program about um, this particular star that's been nicknamed uh, Tabby Star or Voyagin's star. And uh, this was a star that had a very peculiar um, dimming um, um, issues. And, um, and we think it's due to um, a variety of dust and debris, uh, perhaps comets or um, uh, planets smashing into each, each other and creating clouds of dust. And basically the starlight, uh, here's a plot of um, the changes in starlight over time. And uh, we can zoom in to uh, some of those dips. And you know, they're on the order of um, 10, 20%. Uh, percent. But um, what's really unusual about these dips is that they are very regular, um, both in timing as well as the shapes of those dips. So um, they, they tend to be very asymmetric. And so that's why a lot of um, astronomers think that um, some kind of um, dust or debris in orbit around the star um, and that debris field is changing all the time um, that uh, might best explain uh, the behavior of the star. So that brings us to BVV WIT08. And this strange uh, name of the star actually um, has very specific meanings. So BVV stands for Vista Variables in the Via Lactea. And Vista is the name of a telescope in um, Chile. Um, and variables are just variable stars. And Via Lactea, um, because this is Chile, um, which is a Spanish speaking country, Via Lactea and is Spanish for Milky Way. So basically, this is a program run from uh, this particular telescope, the Vista telescope, to observe um, the Milky Way, specifically the bulge of our Milky Way and the disk for variable stars. And um, the, the astronomers want to observe them for many years just to um, look for new variable stars and to see, um, to look for new behaviors, new physics, and so forth. And so uh, this current program has observed over a billion stars and I believe it's still ongoing. Now, the WIT it, um, stands for what is this? And so this is um, actually um, just a, a nomenclature that um, the astronomers with the BVV program came up with because they've been finding um, some strange stars that um, don't behave um, like any other stars. And so, so far, um, they haven't found too many. I mean, this is um, the eighth one um, that they discovered but this is uh, perhaps one of the most um, unusual ones. And um, here um, are um, two images taken um, of that position in the sky where that star is. And the star is where the, um, the light blue circle is. So you can see the light blue circle right here. And there's also a light blue circle there. And um, on the left is when the star um, has dimmed quite a bit. Um, and on the right is when the star has popped back up to its full brightness. And um, so you can see that there's a substantial difference between um, how bright the star was between um, its minimum and maximum brightnesses. And here is um, a plot of um, those brightnesses over time. And this is um, a little confusing uh, because there's actually um, two plots here. But um, so um, we're looking at dates from 2002 to 2020, um, not quite 2020. And we are seeing uh, these uh, points that represent the measurements of the brightness of the star. And there's a gap in the data, but you can see there's a huge drop um, right around 2012, middle of 2012, and then it um, pops back up again. And this box here on the left, lower left, is an expansion of this drop. And so you can see that there, again, is a uh, big gap in the data. Uh, but there's a long, um, you can see that um, the star took a long time to, um, to drop um, in brightness um, on the order of a couple hundred days. And the other thing that's really notable is that the star um, dropped in brightness by 97%. And that is almost unprecedented uh, just because um, stars that are variable um, typically don't have as big of drops. I mean, 97% is huge. And um, there um, are, are a lot of variable stars out there. And, um, and the authors of the paper that um, wrote about BBB WIT08 um, excluded a lot of the um, normal um, explanations that you might have. 
So for instance, there is a type of star variable star called a sepia variable, um, which does um, vary um, innately. Um, it, it pulses and uh, that uh, pulsation leads to variation in brightness. And, but the variations um, typically are on the order of weeks and, um, and, and the uh, variation does recur repeatedly. Um, whereas here you can see that, um, you know, that we saw before in the, um, in the previous plot, uh, this variation occurred once and it didn't seem to happen again. Um, so it, there doesn't seem to be anything um, about the star that um, makes it similar to stars that intrinsically pulse or, or vary. Um, another um, type of variable that um, long puzzled astronomers is a, a star, star called Epsilon Omega, And um, it had been observed for over um, 100 years, I think closer to 200 years. And astronomers noticed that it varied on a time scale about 27 years. And it's really only been in the last decade or so that we um, realized what was going on. And that is that um, Epsilon Omega is actually a binary star. And, um, and that second star um, is orbiting it. And, but that second star has a um, very heavy dust disk around it. And so that dust disk um, will also orbit with that binary pair companion. And as it orbits, it um, blocks um, some or a part or sometimes even most of the light coming from the main part of um, Epsilon or Origae. And um, so here is an artist's conception of what uh, that binary system might look like. And um, astronomers um, have um, studied this quite a bit. And, um, but um, even for Epsilon or Rigae, it doesn't block 97%. I mean, it blocks a lot of the light, but it doesn't uh, block that vast majority of the light. And so um, in the paper, they've um, run a lot of models and um, done a really careful analysis of how the light has changed. And uh, the best um, guess that they have, uh, the best explanation for what's happening uh, for this VBV star is that it is being eclipsed, but it's being eclipsed by um, something in orbit around it that is unseen, um, but it's also elliptical in shape. Um, and so it um, does appear to be some kind of cloud of um, dust or uh, rocks or asteroids. Um, nobody quite knows um, exactly what. And as far as what um, is orbiting it, that um, all this material is in orbit around this um, binary companion, um, there's also um, no um, clear um, understanding. I mean, it could be a very young star, um, a proto star. Um, it could be a, a star that's reached kind of middle age, or it could be a star that's older or on its way um, to its demise. Um, it could even be a black hole or a neutron star. Um, there are a lot of ideas, and um, all these ideas have um, some level of possibility, but um, right now there um, just aren't enough um, data, not enough observations uh, for astronomers to really say um, what is going on. And so, um, you know, this uh, will be work that will continue. Um, astronomers on this team hope to get further observations to try and narrow down um, what the possibilities might be. and. Um, and even in the paper, if you look at the very last paragraph of the paper, they express uh, how much work um, they have to do. So the very last sentence is, despite intensive efforts, it is clear that we have left room for further work on this intriguing object. And I want to, I want to point out the very last um, exclamation point um, that, that ends that sentence. You know, scientific papers are usually very dry and uh, you know, um, you know, direct up to the point. And um, it's very rare to see an exclamation point in any scientific paper, and that's just astronomy papers. And so you can tell um, to, just by adding um, that there, um, the astronomers um, were pretty excited by this object, by just how weird it is, but also excited by the fact that you know, there's a lot more to be learned um, by this unusual discovery. All right, so that's the... Last of my story, and I'll uh, turn it over to Steve, and uh, we will have uh, Q&A um, at the end for both Steve and myself. So definitely feel free to enter your questions into the chat, and we'll be responding to them later. Thanks, everyone. Well, thanks, Gutron, and uh, 
my thanks also to everyone that's uh, joining us. It's uh, This is uh, a program that I guess the museum's been doing for 20-ish years now, so it's, uh, it's a real uh, treat to be able to come back, even though I'm, uh, I've been away for almost a year. So um, those of you that know me, I'm a, a Mars scientist at heart, and uh, I, my custom in 60 Minutes was always to update uh, the Mars missions. And since we actually have lots of new missions at Mars, that's what I wanted to catch you up on tonight. So uh, let me get my PowerPoint up here. <clears throat> so for about the last, uh, well, two and a half years, we'd been talking about the InSight lander, um, which is a, a stationary lander on Mars. It uh, landed in a very smooth area, and its whole purpose uh, for this mission was to probe the internal structure of Mars. And uh, as this slide says, it's taking the vital signs, looking for uh, seismic activity, looking for uh, uh, the seismic signatures of meteoroid impacts. And it was also expected to measure how much heat is flowing from the interior. And uh, so this is a uh, just a graphic of, of how that worked. Here's the uh, the lander. It's solar powered. Um, this is the seismic experiment, which they used this robot arm to um, take from the top of the uh, I'm sorry, top of the uh, lander and uh, and place it gently on the surface where it could uh, uh, detect any seismic uh, activity. And then the, the second instrument was uh, this device, which was the heat flow probe. And we've spent a lot of time talking since the uh, few months after the mission began that this experiment had problems. Um, the, uh, the device itself is sort of a turkey baster sized uh, structure, which was designed to behave like a pile driver where it would drive itself into the surface and it was uh, expected to descend about or penetrate about five meters 15 16 feet below the surface it would string out a cable behind it that had thermal sensors every 10 centimeters or so and um, uh, it would be able to determine how much heat was uh, was escaping from the interior but when they tried to deploy this, it very quickly uh, became obvious that it was going into the surface first at an angle and that it only penetrated about 30 centimeters, so a, less than a third of a meter. And they spent a lot of time trying to uh, investigate this. So this is a view from the uh, camera on the end of the robot arm. Here's the very top of that thermal probe sticking out of the surface and it just couldn't descend any further. So they tried all sorts of things, pushing on it with, uh, with the uh, sample scoop on the end of the arm and scooping material on it and pushing again. And this is an example of, uh, you know, after a year of trying, this was their, their, their final best effort where they, uh, pushed very hard with the uh, the sample scoop and then turned on the, the pile driver mechanism and it just didn't go any deeper. And so they uh, ended up uh, abandoning it. So that experiment has, uh, has not succeeded. And so the entire mission is now uh, concentrating on its seismic uh, uh, survey. And uh, so the one thing they've determined in, in looking at the signatures from the seismometer is it apparently has uh, first a, a sensitivity to the wind blowing over the cable that connects to it. And also as the, uh, the temperatures vary from day to night, which is uh, you know, 140 degree centigrade temperature change, the cable starts sort of contracting and expanding 
and uh, that causes background noise in the seismometer. And so what they've been concentrating on for the last uh, six months or so now is to actually use the scoop to dig up some uh, a scoop full of, uh, of uh, regolith of soil and dump it on top of the seismometer so that it flows down the side and uh, to start burying the cable. And so you can see here's a, a still image. Here's the sample arm. This is the seismometer. And there's the cable. And so they've buried the, the part that's very close to attaching to the seismometer. And with time, they're working their way back to, uh, to get more and more of this buried. And so another activity they've been uh, looking at is trying to increase the amount of solar ener energy that they have. Uh, this was a view just 10 days after landing, and this is one of the two solar panels, uh, sort of brand spanking new and very clean. Here's a view um, 581 days into the mission, and you can see how much dust has accumulated on the, the solar panel. It's gotten very dirty, and uh, Unlike Spirit and Opportunity, the two Mars exploration rovers, there hasn't been enough wind activity or dust devils to go over the solar panel to uh, clean it off, which happened many times with uh, the two solar-powered rovers. They, they uh, were able to extend their mission for 10 years or more just by having the, the solar panels swept clean. And so there's an experiment going on right now where they're picking up uh, a sample scoop full of, of sand and dumping it on top of the lander. And you can see that right here. And uh, the wind is blowing from right to left in uh, this image of the lander. And so this is the solar panel. And they've got this coarser material sitting on top of the uh, the lander and the wind comes along and sweeps a little bit of that coarser material which is easier to move than the fine stuff the dust is and that sweeps it onto the solar panel and in the process of doing that it dislodges some of the dust and so in the experiments they've done so far they actually gained almost 10% in the output of, of that solar panel. And uh, so they're continuing with this experiment. But at this point, they're losing <laughs> the, the, uh, the battle with the accumulating dust. It's still accumulating, uh, even though they've managed to help it a bit. And uh, the latest report is if it keeps deteriorating or reducing the amount of, uh, of power out of the solar panels. They've probably got uh, something like six months of, uh, of uh, life left in the rover before it runs out of uh, electricity or before the, the output from the solar panels isn't enough to keep the heaters uh, active on it and, uh, and whatnot. So we'll keep our fingers crossed on that. Uh, I'm sure the next time we do an update, we'll, uh, we'll be able to tell you some more about that. Um, but for the moment, that's, uh, that's where Insight is. And uh, this is an image from just uh, a few days ago. And uh, you can see how much uh, they've managed to cover up that, that cable. And so both of those activities are, uh, are ongoing. Okay, so let's uh, move to uh, the Curiosity rover and give you a quick update on that. So today is day 3,164 since uh, Curiosity landed. It uh, arrived at Mars in August of uh, 2012. And uh, just to refresh your memory, they landed in this uh, uh, large crater called Gale. And in the center of the crater, there's a roughly 15,000 foot high mound of layered sedimentary rocks. And they landed off the side of that. And the goal was to uh, be able to 
make their way up toward that mountain and sample the, uh, um, the, the rocks and the various layers along the way and get a time history of how this uh, uh, feature was formed. And uh, this is a view sort of zooming in of Gale Crater. It's about a hundred kilometer diameter crater or so. And the uh, fascinating thing about it is there are actually dry river beds flowing into the crater. And so the thinking is that uh, in the distant past, this crater was actually a lake. And then the, uh, the mountain uh, was an island in that lake. And so these sediments were, uh, in, were laid down uh, by water. And so the, the blue teardrop here is the location of Curiosity right now, and we'll keep zooming in. So at the, the bottom here is that mountain called Mount Sharp. And uh, this was the landing point for the uh, Curiosity. And over the course of the last, gosh, almost nine years now, this is the path it's taken. And uh, here's where we're sitting right now. These are essentially the foothills for Mount Sharp. And uh, each one of these is uh, it has very beautiful layers in the sedimentary rock. And so they're slowly climbing through this uh, history book of, of Mars. And here's the closest up view of where they're, they're sitting today. And so this is a view from uh, the cameras. Um, this is their, their immediate uh, target to drive closer to this uh, knob. This, uh, by the way, is about um, 20 meters uh, tall. So 60, 70 feet, something like that. So it's not a huge mountain. It's more of a, I guess I would call it a, a knob. Um, but here's a beautiful view that was just taken within the last month. So it's a selfie of the, uh, the rover sitting next to this uh, sand dune or uh, sand ripples. And then here's that, that knob that they're going to be driving toward. And then once they're done with that, it's on to the next one. And the other uh, interesting thing is they've been seeing lots of clouds uh, in this area of Mars where Curiosity is sitting. And so this is a view very early morning, uh, just before sunrise. And these very beautiful high cirrus clouds. So these are like we see um, you know, here uh, on Earth, typically on very cold days in the winter. And in this case, the, the sun is just below the horizon, but we're getting iridescence where the, the ice crystals are acting as little prisms. And uh, in fact, the uh, looking at these clouds from orbit with other spacecraft, they can take the temperature of the altitude in the atmosphere that these clouds are forming and they're, uh, they're carbon dioxide ice clouds, so uh, dry ice clouds, not water ice clouds right now. We certainly see water ice clouds uh, at other times of year, but uh, right now it's, uh, it's uh, uh, winter time in this, uh, in this location, and Mars is farthest from the sun in its uh, orbital cycle, so this is the coldest time of the year, and uh, these clouds are, are forming. And this is just another beautiful shot of this. There's that, uh, that knob that they're heading towards. Here's these, some more of these carbon dioxide clouds shining in the atmosphere. And the other thing to note here is just all these beautiful layers in, uh, in this uh, rock. So uh, they're, they're, after all these years, they're finally getting to the, to the real meat of this mission. They've been slowly heading toward the foothills, and now they're, they're there. So uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, sampling happening over uh, uh, the next several years, and, uh, and lots of exciting uh, geology and geochemistry uh, taking place. 
So uh, this is uh, uh, one of the most recent images taken just uh, yesterday, I believe. And uh, this is this is the direction they're they're heading once they uh, get past that uh, that knob that we've been looking at. And so here's the the recap for um, Curiosity day 3164. It's driven almost 26 kilometers at this point. And look at that uh, image count. It's uh, it's going to be pushing a million images very very soon. So. Um, its spacecraft is healthy. It's uh, continuing with its uh, mission, and uh, and there's just going to be uh, lots and lots of great science coming out of this in the future. Okay, so let's move on to the most recent uh, arrival on the surface. Um, this is the Mars 2020 mission, the Perseverance um, rover, and this uh, set down in mid. February of this year, and so it's only day 129 since landing. And to refresh your memory of, of where uh, Perseverance is, um, this is called Jezro Crater. It's uh, again another large impact crater that has a dry river bed flowing into it, um, and so this crater at some point in the past would have been uh, filled with water, so another crater lake. But what's very different about this compared to Gale Crater with Curiosity is there's actually a river delta right here that is preserved in the floor of this crater. And since uh, deltas on the Earth are prime areas for uh, life to occur, bacteria, algae, small things like uh, brine shrimp, for example. I'm not saying those exist on Mars, but they certainly, it, it's just the prime place to look for that and to see if there is preserved evidence of, uh, of biology in, in the past. And so this is just an artist view of what, uh, what uh, Jezero might have looked like uh, when there was uh, more water on Mars, so several billion years ago. And this is a closer up view. There's that uh, riverbed flowing in. Here's that, that delta that, uh, uh, that they're very interested in. And so Perseverance landed more or less right here. So it's an easy drive to, uh, to where the delta is. And they're, uh, they're planning over the course of this mission to drive up to the delta, climb onto the top of it, and then ultimately uh, move their way toward the rim of the crater and uh, follow this, uh, this riverbed. So uh, one of the things that is a primary focus of this mission is to actually collect samples and store them either on board the rover or to drop them into various locations on the surface. And then the next major, uh, at least American European Mars mission is going to be a sample return mission. Um, later this decade, they're uh, expecting to send uh, another spacecraft with a small rover that will go out and retrieve these sample tubes that uh, Perseverance has collected and uh, bring them back to the, the lander for that mission. That will launch that, uh, those samples into Mars orbit. They'll be picked up by another uh, orbiting spacecraft, and that will launch itself back to the Earth. And so if plans hold, by the early 2030s, we will have um, uh, several hundred grams of Mars samples in uh, laboratories here on on Earth. And so this is uh, just a, an artist view of dropping some of those, uh, those uh, sample tubes off. These are about the size of, uh, well, a, a cigar tube, I guess. Uh, uh, so not terribly large, but they're, they're hermetically sealed and they're very uh, well characterized as to where these samples were picked up. 
So uh, here's uh, just a view of, of the landing site, and uh, it's off in the distance here is uh, part of that river delta that they want to get to. Um, this is a closer up view of a remnant of that uh, of that delta, and so this is the uh, the general area that they're heading toward first. But uh, one of the real exciting things over the last month is uh, the last couple of months, starting in April, is this small drone helicopter um, Ingenuity has been making test flights on uh, the surface of Mars. And so just to give you an idea of the size, here was uh, uh, the uh, helicopter being prepared before launch. The uh, electronics box or the body is about the size of a, um, a toaster, not much bigger, say a, a shoe box. And the blades are about uh, a little under four feet in diameter. And so here's where the helicopter was attached to the belly of the rover. And then uh, this was a view of unfolding the helicopter and depositing it on the surface. And this happened uh, in, uh, in early April. And uh, as the, uh, once it was on the surface, uh, Perseverance backed off and uh, left it there. And so they got some nice, uh, close-up views of it before the the rover departed um so the the drone is solar powered it's got a, a small solar panel uh on the top and so once it makes a flight it takes multiple days for it to recharge its batteries and um and then do another flight and so this is just uh some testing that went on of just trying to make sure that the the rotors spin and uh, here's a view of, of the first flight. So it uh, basically just uh, went up about uh, um, 10 meters and then dropped back down and landed in the same spot. And then uh, on the second and third flight, let's see, the helicopter is down here. They uh, took off, ascended to about 10 meters and then flew a little over 100 meters downrange, turned around and came back and landed in the same spot. And uh, this is just a view out of the, uh, the, the, the helicopter has two cameras on board. One is looking straight down. This is a navigation camera. So this is the shadow of of the helicopter as it's just taken off from the surface, you can see uh, the shadow of the leg there. And this is when it climbed up to a higher altitude. So that's the uh, the shadow of the helicopter being cast on the surface. And so this will uh, make you motion sick, but this is a view as the helicopter flew across the surface. They identified a software issue that they've since fixed where um, it was having a little bit of trouble staying stable and was sort of lurching around. But uh, anyway, it succeeded and there it, it landed. And so this is a view from the color camera looking slightly forward of the direction the helicopter is flying. And the one thing you might see here, and I'll zoom in on it, is the uh, Perseverance rover sitting off in the in the distance. So it. Uh, Got a, an image of its mothership. And then uh, here's a view from Perseverance after one of these flights of uh, the rover, I'm sorry, the helicopter sitting off in the distance. So they've been uh, commissioning the, the rover to do its science mission. And one of the instruments it's got is a, is a laser instrument, a high powered laser that they can zap the surface with and convert the whatever it uh, the laser hits into a plasma and then they have a spectrometer that can measure the composition of of the plasma and determine remotely without actually touching the surface uh, what the composition is and so all of these little closely spaced divots here are where there was a laser shot just into the regolith um, this is a, a view with the microscope camera here's a couple of the uh, 
uh, laser shots there. And here's a rock that they did it to. So you can see these, uh, these little um, pits in the, in the rock. And so they've been testing this uh, instrument and, and it's working very well. Uh, just uh, sort of a scenic tour here of uh, nearby the, uh, the landing site. Lots of very uh, intriguing rocks. And uh, so they've been uh, using the robot arm, making sure that it works correctly. I mean, this whole phase is called the commissioning phase of the uh, spacecraft. So you need to test and make sure that all of the instruments, all the mechanisms are working. And uh, there's a camera on the end of that turret, and it can zoom in onto the surface and act as a microscope. So that's uh, just the view of that happening. And then, so they've, for the last month now, have been driving. And uh, they're moving slowly across the surface, getting to where they, uh, they need to be. And uh, so the mission is continuing. And this was a test of the auto navigation system where they uh, purposely told it to drive toward an obstacle. And it did that. And it uh, very uh, deftly avoided the obstacle and kept driving. And so here's the view off to where they're they're now heading, and here's uh, just another another view. Um, and this is sort of a telescopic view of that uh, outcrop that uh, that they're heading toward. And uh, lots of things that are exciting the the geologists are this evidence that water laid down this uh, this feature. And so here's where they're they're heading. This was the landing site. Right now, they're uh, they're moving off in this direction, and uh, then once they're done analyzing these rocks, they'll retrace their steps, go this way to get up to the uh, um, the the delta formation. And so, I'm going to end with this slide. This is a dust devil just off in the distance, and. Uh, Nope, the, the mission continues. So uh, here we are, it's day 129. They've driven a little less than a kilometer and so far returned about 100,000 images. So I think I'm going to pause there or end there and I'll turn it back to Kachun. And uh, I'm going to have to decamp for just a minute and I'll be back in about two minutes. So uh, be right back. All right. Well, thank you so much for those presentations. That was wonderful. Um, if you really only had 60 minutes for space tonight and you need to leave, we understand. Thank you for joining us. We hope you can stick around, though, because we have lots of really interesting questions. And Kachun, how are the names for the exoplanets chosen? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, Obviously, there are um, star names that have come down um, through history um, to us, um, you know, like um, Sirius or Castor or Pollux, um, and, um, and but, um, over the years, um, we've gotten uh, more and more complicated with star names just because um, there are many more stars that can be observed and um, can be um, seriously named. And so oftentimes what happens is um, the naming convention is named, um, is based on um, a particular mission or a particular catalog or a particular group of scientists um, that um, have come together to, to map the this, this sky. And so uh, let me just share my screen again. Um, you know, I, we talked um, briefly about um, Tabby's um, star or Boyajian star, but its official name is KIC8462852. And um, the K um, in this case stands for Kepler. And I think the IC means input um, catalog. And so this is a star um, that um, might have been observed by um, other astronomers and other programs, uh, but in this case, um, you know, the, the work on the star was based on Kepler data, and so they used um, the Kepler nomenclature for this particular star. And so in this case, this was a catalog of stars that um, was inputted into the Kepler program as stars that they would monitor. And um, for, in, in, at least in the case of Kepler, 
um, when they discovered a potential candidate for a um, star with uh, uh, planets around it, um, they would um, give it um, a new nomenclature, KOI, meaning Kepler object of interest. And so you can imagine um, the other, not just um, one or even a dozen, but there are probably hundreds of different um, observational programs. And so one star might ha actually have many, many names, which can be um, really confusing. But um, they're definitely, um, most of the time, um, when you do see really complicated names like this, it has to um, do with a particular science program or mission that observed um, that particular star. And then when it comes to exoplanets, how are those named? Well, um, oftentimes um, the, the, uh, the, the simplest um, way of naming an exoplanet is to give it the same name as a star, but you um, append a lowercase letter after it. So um, you know, we, um, we recently discovered a, uh, a planet around the closest star to us, which is Proxima Centauri, and the, the original star, Proxima Centauri, um, is by default Proxima Centauri A. And so the planet that was discovered around it is Proxima Centauri lowercase b. And for subsequent planets that get discovered, you then add additional letters like um, C, D, E, F, and so on. Um, and so far, we haven't um, discovered enough planets around a single star where you start um, running out of um, letters. Um, but there is a program um, in place um, run by the International Astronomical Union to come up with um, more familiar um, names, meaning proper names for planets. And because it's, it's an international organization, um, they have um, kind of a long uh, process where people can submit names, um, it's, it gets vetted, you know, the, um, and, and then um, after um, some decision making, um, the name is officially uh, given to that uh, particular planet. And uh, so far, I think there have been um, just over 100 um, names that have been given, um, you know, based on uh, various co um, cultural um, or other names of significance that people from around the world has, have submitted. But I suspect that um, this program um, probably won't work uh, uh, forever just because the number of planets that we've been discovering um, have been doubling um, every three years or so. And so it's expected, you know, if it continues at this rate, we're going to have over a million exoplanets um, in another, you know, uh, in less than 20 years. And so there's just no way that the IAU can uh, keep up with this um, kind of slow, deliberate method. So we'll probably always have um, the, the weird um, uh, name of numbers and, and letters that don't make any sense of the words of the astronomers. All right, wonderful. <laughs> a scientific tradition continues. <laughs> And uh, Steve, people are wondering, how do we drive the rovers on Mars? Is it like Mario Kart? No, that's a, that's a good question. And uh, the problem arises because of the, the distance between the two planets, where uh, like right now it's 20 plus minutes for a radio signal to get one way. And so you're not driving with a joystick. And I'd mentioned in that one image from uh, Perseverance of testing the auto navigation or the auto drive system. And so once they've proven the systems, they uh, specify that we want you to go to that rock or that feature that's 200 meters away and the rover figures out the path. It's got, uh, pairs of cameras in the front and in the back. It can drive both directions. Um, and those cameras get stereo images. So on board the rover, it can make a three-dimensional map of what's ahead of it. And uh, they program it for how big of an obstacle it can just drive over, um, how steep a slope it can be on, um, things like that. and. Uh, figures out its own way. So if there's a really big rock right in front of you, it will stop, it will figure out, can I go to the right? Can I go to the left? And it uh, it proceeds accordingly. And then um, ditto, you don't wanna, you wanna make sure that it doesn't drive off the edge of a cliff or things like that. So they, they put constraints on it to tell it how far it can go and, uh, 
That's the only way you can really do this is to have it figure out its own way. And that's actually worked quite well. They, uh, I think curiosity in a number of cases, it's uh, driven well over a hundred meters in a single session. Um, I think opportunity uh, years ago set the record for that, which was like 220 meters, something like that. So, you know, a couple football fields in a day. All right. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. And Kachun, uh, a couple of questions about what we can see with exoplanets and what we can't see. So when we look at the all these, um, like we can only see stars that cross between, that we're in the ecliptic of, or planets rather. Do we have any way of extrapolating how many other planets that don't cross that ecliptic there might be? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, um, so um, the one thing, one thing that we've um, discovered is that um, the orientations of the planes of solar systems um, is pretty um, random, meaning there's no preferred um, you know, orientation. Of, so you don't expect um, any solar system to be aligned in any one direction. Um, you know, even um, you know, the, the Milky Way is set up so that all the stars and most of the stars orbit in a plane. We can make a model of the uh, Milky Way using a dinner plate, for instance. Um, when solar systems form, when stars form, they get um, expelled um, uh, from the molecular cloud or the cloud, molecular cloud of environment dissipates. Uh, but there are enough interactions that it really randomizes the orientations of those solar systems. So we could pretty much expect that um, the or, um, orbital planes of planets around other stars to be random. And so you can just work out mathematically you know, what fraction of them um, would be lined up. And then you just scale up um, the probability. Um, and so um, it's by using those um, sort of mathematical arguments that you can make the case that there are probably, you know, even though um, the number of Earth-sized planets we've discovered um, is relatively small compared to um, larger planets, there are probably tens of billions um, um, of Earth-like Earth Earth-sized worlds throughout our galaxy, or many billions. Cool, cool. That's so exciting when science makes sci science fiction seem more plausible. <laughs> um, so Steve, this is a great question for you because you used to be an engineer. Um, people are wondering, they've suggested fans or like a little brush or some elect electrostatic cleaning thing for the solar panels. Did NASA consider any sort of solar panel cleaning mechanism? Well, that's again, that's a question that arises a lot of, of why do we let solar panels get dirty on the surface? And uh, I think that was certainly true back in Spirit and Opportunities Day. And both of those missions, they had scaled the 90 days was the expected lifetime because after that, there'd be too much dust. And they were very surprised when these dust devils kept coming by and sweeping the dust off. Um, so I think using that and having um, other spacecraft there with, uh, with solar panels, the experience has been that they tend to maybe not get completely clean, but it doesn't uh, it's not a steady state. You you dump some dust on it from the atmosphere, and then it gets partially cleaned, and so that makes it longer. And uh, you know, the, from the engineering side, you don't want to make it any more complicated, any more expensive than you have to. And anything that has uh, moving parts or mass is the big deal. You know, if you have a two kilogram sweeping device, then that's two kilograms of science instruments you can't have. Um, on InSight, they actually did try moving the motors that unfolded the, uh, the solar panels so it would shake them slightly, and that didn't move the dust. The dust is really sticky stuff. Um, and so they decided to try this method where you drop some of this stuff upwind of the solar panel and then it would sweep across. Uh, doesn't work as well if you just drop it directly onto the solar panel and make them even dirtier. So uh, 
I know it's not a very good answer, but it, it really comes down to there's a limited lifetime to the missions. You decide what that is that allows you to do your, uh, your mission, and you don't overbuild the spacecraft to, to uh, make it more complicated than it has to be. All right. Well, thank you for that. That's, yeah, it's good to know people were thinking about it. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure who this question is for, but what's up with the Hubble telescope? What's Hubble doing these days? Katrin, I expect you're up on that one. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's been any um, recent news. For those of you who might've missed it a couple weeks ago, the uh, Hubble Space Telescope went into um, a safe mode meaning um, they basically stopped all operations uh, of it uh, because something went wrong and the engineers have been uh, spending the last several weeks um, trying to figure out what. Uh, basically, um, I guess one of the onboard computers or one of the main computers that allow um, the Hubble to operate um, failed and then they um, turned on the backup computer and that also failed. And so that suggests, that, um, at least at the time, that it wasn't um, necessarily um, the failure of the computer, but it could have been some other component um, that was connected to the computer um, that was failing, or you know, might have had um, a voltage difference um, that prevented the computers from uh, communicating um, correctly. And so um, the last I heard, um, they were still investigating um, that and, and trying to pursue and, and, and figure out exactly which component um, could be causing the problem. And so um, right now there isn't any news about um, whether they've um, figured anything out or identified uh, the point of failure yet. All right, well, we'll all cross our fingers for Hubble. <laughs> um, and Steve, this is a question we got a couple months ago and you said we would have to wait for the data for a while. So now we're gonna ask you again, did the InSight seismometer detect the landing of Perseverance? I have not heard that it has. I know they were they were looking for it and also for the Chinese uh, mission that landed. And um, I certainly haven't seen any headlines to, to that effect. I, uh, I do know based on what they've been uh, talking about with the seismometer is there's some noise in the background that makes these really faint things like landing on the other side of the planet. Um, hard to tease out of the data. It doesn't mean it can't be done. It's just, it takes a lot of work. Um, one thing I, I had neglected to put into my talk just because we were limited in time is just the quick update on the Chinese mission. It landed successfully in uh, mid-February and the rover has departed from the landing spacecraft. It's driven a couple of tens of meters at this point, uh, very slowly, they're, they're very limited in their communications capabilities with this mission, but everything is, is going well uh, with that mission. So, so far, it's, it's all going according to plan. Well, excellent. That's great. And get ready for that question again. Okay. Next time we see you. <laughs> I will keep an eye out for it. And uh, All right, well, we're getting to the end of time. So uh, just a couple more questions. Um, Kachun, what makes them think that the, uh, in the VVV WIT star, what makes them think that the object is oval? What's the difference in a pattern between oval and round? Well, um, they, what they basically did was um, to run a, a number of different, different models um, to try and determine um, you know, the likelihood that um, it was an ob object orbiting. And so in their models, um, they would uh, vary um, the uh, orbital distance, the size of uh, this occluding object. And, um, you know, in most things in astronomy or around or um, soidal in shape, um, whether it's a planet or a star, you know, those are close to a spherical, but dust clouds um, tend, um, um, or accretion disks um, tend to be kind of flattened um, spheres or, or ellipsoids. And um, so, so, the, so the simplest model that you can build is to assume that it is um, kind of a roundish like object. And um, I didn't um, look closely, but I mean, um, in order to vary um, all their parameters, they probably ran 
uh, many thousands, if not tens of thousands of simulations. And from all that, um, the having something that was ellipsoidal in shape in, in orbit um, best fit the data. Um, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, so far, um, they don't um, have enough data to really uh, go beyond um, this basic model that they have. That, um, you know, they think that this model um, is probably the most correct, um, but um, they still don't have a good idea of what um, could actually be circling um, that contains this dust cloud. And there's also, also always the chance that um, with better or more data, uh, this model uh, could turn out to be wrong. Um, you know, maybe it isn't um, dust or debris that's around a second star or second star-like object in orbit. Maybe um, there's a way that you come up with a um, debris um, cloud that's um, just in orbit around the star. Uh, but um, that you know, just means that more work needs to be done. And before I let you go, our most asked question tonight, and I know you put it in the chat, but what is your background image? Uh, it's a, a clip from um, the film Grand Budapest Hotel. So I think that came out about um, seven years ago. It's directed by Wes Anderson. Here I thought it was Seattle. <laughs> no, that's, that's more um, Mitch's background. And then Steve, for a last question, this is a very, uh, um, a lot of people were surprised to hear about clouds and wind. And just in general, we're wondering, can you just give us a little overview of Mars's atmosphere? Sure, well, it's, first of all, it's very, very thin. Um, at the surface, it's about six tenths of a percent Earth atmospheric pressure. So it's equivalent to being you know, 80,000 feet altitude on the Earth, pretty good vacuum. Um, it's primarily carbon dioxide and a little bit of water vapor mixed in, but there is enough density to the atmosphere that the wind does blow. It's not terribly effective. Um, I think the like a hundred mile an hour wind on Mars would be the equivalent force of about a 10 mile an hour wind on the earth. So it's, uh, uh, you know, it can blow sand sized material but it more or less just hops along it's not like it's not like the martian where you see this raging gale knocking things over um at, at most it shakes things a little bit um, it can move dust and and sand along um, there are dust storms there are dust devils so hopefully that's uh that's it in a nutshell it's not completely a vacuum. It's not, uh, um, you know, it takes a long time for the wind to move a significant amount of material or erode things, but it does happen over geologic timescales. All right, wonderful. Well, I think that's about all the time that we have tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, this is wonderful. I hope you can come to our next program, which I should have looked up the date for that, but keep an eye on our website. <laughs> um, and hopefully we'll get that information out to you. <laughs> and uh, everyone have a wonderful evening. Great. Bye everyone. Bye everybody. Have a great fourth.